What's going on, everybody? Um, I decided to kind of hop on the microphone here. This could be a little bit off the cuff. I breezed through all the uh, studies that we're going to talk about here in this show um, very briefly. We'll just kind of see where it goes. Um, a topic that kind of has come up a lot recently in libertarian circles is social conservatism um, with the rise of <laughs> the woke bullshit that we all know and uh, love. Not really, but um, <laughs> the woke stuff that's been going on, it's kind of anti-family because some of it seems to have its roots in this cultural Marxism and um, this idea that the nuclear family isn't um, perhaps the bedrock of society and that, um, you know, it's okay to identify and do really whatever you want and free love and all this crazy BS, in my opinion. Um, to give full disclosure on kind of a little bit of my history and where I am now, um, it was not always this way and always felt that social conservatism was the way um, I used to think a little bit more along the lines of, you know, well, it doesn't really matter. But um, as I kind of get older and have a desire for more of a, you know, socially conservative lifestyle. And as I learn more and more, I, I have come to realize that I think that this is the best way forward for society um, in general. I don't think societies that are based around the acceptance of free love for everybody and everybody smoking weed on the corners and the hippy dippy lifestyle that some libertarians would tout, I don't think that's the best society to tolerate freedom. And um, what do I mean by tolerate freedom? Well, freedom comes with responsibility, right? Um, because you need to deal with the consequence of your actions. So when you have tight knit families, as in a mother and a father in the house and them raising the child peacefully and them understanding, you know, disciplinary actions and consequences and, you know, being responsible, this personal responsibility that um, that's able to, you know, perhaps I think generate more of a culture that can tolerate freedom and once again the consequences of that people understanding that they have you know certain duties to uphold within the society and um to other people you can't just run around you know banging everything that walks and doing all these drugs and living like a degenerate and expect to maintain that freedom in my opinion because um you know, you need to have trust within a community and within the family so that way when things fall apart, you have people there to pick you up, right? If we want to live in Ancapistan, then we're going to need a lot of trust within the community so that way we don't have to seek a state or grow any kind of government body to um, supplement us because we can't rely on our own families. Um, it's been a little bit of point of my or of a point in this podcast that I really want to drive this home. I really want people to understand that it's very important that you have solid families, strong families, and strong individuals within those families, so that way you can greater tolerate the responsibilities that come with freedom. Um, I, I do believe that there is a certain amount of responsibility that comes with freedom, and I don't think that we can have the maximum amount of freedom if we don't have a respect for property rights and, once again, personal responsibility. You have to take care of yourself and your immediate family before you know you can really go out there and do anything else, in my opinion, sufficiently. Um, it's a cliche saying, but don't pour from an empty glass. Well, if you don't have anything in that glass, how can you you know go out and change the world? It's Jordan Peterson line, right? clean up your room before you go and try and change the world. I completely agree with that. And the reason why it resonates with so many people is because it's very true. You shouldn't, you know, go out and try and change the world when you can't even do anything yourself. You know, if you're overweight, obese, you're mentally mess, you're mentally unstable, um, you're in the midst of a divorce or, you know, you and your girlfriend are breaking up, whatever, um, you have a lot to settle before you can go out and make recommendations of other people. You know, you wouldn't take diet advice from a fat guy. And, and I'm not saying that obese people are bad people or they don't know anything. I'm just saying you would kind of think twice because you realize that if they really understood and lived the said principles that they're trying to teach you, um, they would embody that a little bit better. Um, so, you know, I preach health and liberty on this podcast. And I like to believe that I you know, kind of live that life. Um, I eat well, I track everything that goes into my mouth. I weigh out my food quite often. I get a lot of, you know, physical activity in throughout the day and I exercise six days a week and I do not miss workouts. Um, I want to be as free and as, you know, 
I, I want to have the longest health span, not just lifespan, the longest health span that I possibly can. You know, what the hell is living if you get to 80 years old and you need a uh, wheelchair to get around? That's not life and that's not liberty. That's not freedom. You are not free if you cannot physically handle yourself into an old age. Therefore, that's why I think it's so important to take personal responsibility for your health so that way you can have the longest lifespan and health span possible. Um, and that's not really going to be the entire purpose of this podcast today, but um, I just kind of want to put that out there. So um, without further ado, let's get into a little bit of the uh, science and the nitty gritty here. We're going to talk about um, some kind of like single motherhood and um, developing trust within societies. So let me make sure I got this all right. All right. Um, the changing profile of unmarried parents, a growing share are living with a partner. Um, one in four parents are living with a child in the United States today are unmarried. Driven by declines in marriage overall, as well as increases in births outside of marriage, this marks a dramatic change from a half century ago when fewer than one in 10 parents living with their children were unmarried, 7%. So as you can see back in 1968, um, only 7% were that way. And now it's up to a quarter. And what this signifies, um, in my mind, at least, and people can bust my balls about this, tell me that I'm wrong, but um, it's a cultural shift. and I don't think it's for the better. When you marry somebody, you're saying that I'm going to, you know, sink my claws into you. You are, you know, we're stuck. This is, you know, a union. We're together and we're going to fulfill our duties to society and to our families. We're going to have children. We're going to raise them. And there's no plan B, at least that's the way that I look at it. You marry somebody because you love them and you foresee yourself in the future with them. Therefore, you kind of staple yourself to them because you realize that you two work better together, you know, and that you're going to raise a family and help, you know, spread your, um, your legacy throughout the generations. And hopefully your kids will embody those same values that you pass on to them. Um, at the same time, the profile of unmarried parents has shifted markedly, according to a new Pew Research Center analysis of Census Bureau data. Solo mothers, those who are raising at least one child with no spouse or partner in the home, no longer dominate the ranks of the unmarried parents as they once did. In 1968, 88% of unmarried parents fell into this category. By 1997, that share had dropped to 68%. And in 2017, the share of unmarried parents who were solo mothers declined to 53%. These declines in solo mothers have been entirely offset by increases in cohabitating parents. Now, now 35% of all unmarried parents are living with a partner. Meanwhile, the share of unmarried parents who are solo fathers held steady at 12%. Um, I believe that the incentives for women are so at this point that it no longer really benefits them as much as it once did to have a man in the house. So therefore, if you kick the man out or if you're not married, then you could still get a lot of government benefits without having a man in the home. And I really think that's to the detriment of our society. I don't think that's a good thing. Um, due primarily to the rising number of cohabitating parents, the share of unmarried parents who are fathers has more than doubled over the past 50 years. Now 29% of all unmarried parents who reside with their children are fathers compared with just 12% in 1968. While it's well established that married parents are typically better off financially than unmarried parents, there are also differences in financial well-being among unmarried parents. For example, a much larger share of solo parents are living in poverty compared with cohabitating parents, 27% for 16%. There are differences in the demographic profiles of each group as well. Cohabitating parents are younger, less educated, and less likely to have ever been married than solo parents. At the same time, solo parents have fewer children on average than cohabiting parents and are far more likely to live or to be living with one of their own parents. Um, I, you know, it's it's been thrown all around a lot that to basically not be poor in America, all you have to do is graduate high school and don't have kids till you get married. And I, I think that's pretty true. Um, and I've tried to live that to my best ability. Um, I know a lot of people who had kids before wedlock or who just never even got married or, or even with the partner that they're with. And they're in a lot of trouble. You, they struggle to, you know, meet bills sometimes. So that's a very, very sad thing. I think that if you're going to have a child with somebody, then this should be someone that you've vetted very, very thoroughly and that you know very, very well, and that you're sure that you can spend the rest of your life with. Because I really do think that when you and somebody else decide to have a kid, it's no longer about you. It's about the child, right? That child did not choose you or your partner as the parents. You guys, you know, did what you did. And now a baby is the result of that. And that's okay. 
but there's responsibility with that. And that child should not have to suffer the quality of life because you and somebody else were irresponsible. It's just my opinion and people are free to disagree, but that's just kind of how I feel about it. As the number of parents who are unmarried has grown, so is the number of children living with an unmarried parent. In 1968, 13% of children, 9 million in all, were living in this type of arrangement. By 2017, that share had increased to about one third, 32%. Of U.S. children, or 24 million. However, the share of children who will ever experience life with an unmarried parent is likely considerably higher, given how fluid the U.S. families have become. One estimate suggests that by the time they turn nine, more than 20% of U.S. children born to a married couple, and over 50% of those born to a cohabiting couple, will have experienced a breakup of their parents. For instance, the declining stability of families is linked to both increases in cohabiting relationships, which tend to be less long-lasting than marriages, as well as long-term increase in divorce. Indeed. Half of solo parents in 2017, 52%, had been married at one time, and the same is true for about one-third of cohabiting parents. Um, I have looked into this before, and I probably should have prepared it for this show, but um, if you actually get married and then move in, you're actually much, much more likely to stay together, despite what people would have you believe. Um, personally, I think it's just because you've basically signed a contract with this person, and you've told them that, look, we're together. <laughs> this is it well you know we're gonna rock and roll for better or for worse and personally i i'm getting married within a few months and i plan for that to you know for that to be the way it's going to be we want to have children and i don't have a big plan b i'm not banking on her and i splitting up i love her dearly and um you know i'm in this for the long haul i want to have kids and i want them to be successful and i want them to grow up to be autonomous um individuals who are capable of great things um my parents had passed that on to me and i enjoy my life very much so therefore i'm paying it forward by um giving hopefully more individuals that same gift um, while it has become more common in recent decades many americans view the increase in unmarried parenthood solo mothering especially as a negative trend for society i would agree in a 2015 Pew Research Center survey, two-thirds of adults said that more single women raising children on their own was bad for society, and 48% said the same about more unmarried couples raising children. Acceptance of unmarried parents tends to be particularly low among whites, college graduates, and Republicans. Even so, other data suggest a slight uptick in acceptance. In 1994, 35% of adults agreed or strongly agreed that single parents could raise children as well as two married parents, according to data from the General Social Survey. By 2012, the share who said as much had risen to 48%. Um, I think that's a very reasonable statement. Um, you know, men and women are different. <laughs> that's a controversial statement, 2022, but men and women are just simply different. Um, there are things that I'm good at that my fiance is not good at. And there's things that my fiance are good at that I'm not good at. And that's okay. Um, mothers and fathers are both different. And I believe that in a child's life, they're both required, um, both for men and women. Men need good role models. So that way they become good men when they grow up and women need good men role models. So that way, when they grow up, they know kind of what qualities to look for in men. And, um, Men, um, you know, it's just very important for children to have both parents. I don't think, I don't see that as a controversial statement. I know that some people think that single mothers are perfectly fine, but I don't think that's a good trend for society. And we can kind of see um, how it's playing out right now. And it's not good. Um, in my opinion, you need a state when you have this rising rate of single mothers or men who ditch their financial and moral obligation because, you know, there's no one there to take care of the kids. So, and generally the parents may step in, but, you know, if that goes rampant, how many parents are in the financial situation to stick up and, you know, help single mothers or single fathers, even there's a lot less of them. Um, how many people are going to be able to step in and do that? Declines in marriage and increases in non-marital births have driven a rise in unmarried parenting. The rise over the past half century in the U.S. share of all parents who are unmarried and living with a child younger than 18 has been driven by increases in all types of unmarried parents. Excuse me. In 1968, only 1% of all parents were solo fathers. That figure has risen to 3%. At the same time, the share of all parents who are solo mothers has doubled from 7% up to 13%. Since 1997, the first year for which data on cohabitation are available, the share of parents that are cohabiting has risen from four to nine percent. All told, more than 16 million U.S. parents with no spouse at home are now living with their child 
younger than 18, up from 4 million in 1968 and just under 14 million in 1997. The growth in unmarried parenthood overall has been driven by several demographic trends. Perhaps most important has been the decline in the share of people overall who are married. In 1970, about 7 in 10 U.S. adults aged 18 and older were married. In 2016, that share stood at 50%. Both delays in marriage and long-term increase in divorce have fueled this trend. In 1968, the median age at first marriage for men was 23, and for women it was 21. In 2017, the median age for or at first marriage was 30, for men and for and 27 for women. At the same time, mis or marriages are more likely to end in divorce now than they were almost a half century ago. For instance, among men whose first marriage began in the late 1980s, about 76% were still in those marriages 10 years later. Well, this figure was 88% for men whose marriages began in the 1950s. Um, kind of finish up this little section here and we'll uh, kind of move on to the next thing. Not only are fewer Americans getting married, but it's also becoming more common for unmarried people to have babies. In 1970, there were 26 births per 1,000 unmarried women ages 15 to 44, while that rate in 2016 stood at 42 births per 1,000 unmarried women. Meanwhile, birth rates for married women have declined from 121 births per 1,000 down to about 90. As a result, in 2016, four in 10 births were to women who were either solo mothers or living with a non-marital partner. Increases in the number of cohabiting parents raising children have also contributed to the overall growth in unmarried parenthood. In 1997, the first year for which data on cohabitation are available, 20% of unmarried parents who lived with their children were also living with a partner. Since that time, the shares were to 35%. The tr this trend has boosted overall the share of unmarried parents who are fathers. In 1968, just 12% were fathers. By 1997, the share had risen to 22%, and in 2017, it stood at 29%. At the same time, solo parents remain overwhelmingly female. 81% of solo parents in 2017 were mothers, as were 88% in 1968. Um, to kind of talk about different demographics and stuff like that, um, I'll put this in the show notes below, just so that way anybody who kind of wants to breeze through this, you can. Um, I, I just don't think this is a good trend to um, continually have more and more single parents, because as I kind of stressed on earlier, um, children need mothers and fathers. There are certain behaviors and relationships and different dynamics in said relationships that children need to observe to make sure that they kind of replicate those behaviors later on. And obviously, it's not safe they're a blank slate because everybody kind of has innate features that they're born with. But, um, you know, we're all still very moldable and we should, you know, do our best to teach our children, um, you know, the best habits and um, the best skills to go forward and live a life that they can, you know, be happy in and hopefully raise a beautiful, successful family. So I'm just going to kind of breeze through this, but this is also about trust. So trust may sound arbitrary, but um, it's very important to have trust because if you don't trust your community, if you don't trust your neighbors, if you don't trust your family, then once again, you're going to need a state to take care of you when you fall down, right? So here they... Um, just quantify changes in trust on growth. So changes to economic growth, if 50% of the population, quote, trust most people. So as you can see, um, the GDP in US dollars increases as you get more and more trust. United States down here at um, 0.7 and our GDP, you know, hasn't changed as much in proportion due to our lack of trust. Um, once again, this will just be in the show notes if you guys kind of want to look through this. It's a pretty interesting article. Um, exploring the relationship between trust and macroeconomic growth. From a supply side perspective, there are just two ways to raise per capita GDP growth. Increase business investment or raise productivity, and trust affects both. A rise in trust not only increases the quantity of businesses' fixed investment, but it also boosts productivity growth through higher quality investments, human capital accumulation, organizational improvements, and internalization. See sidebar link between capita, real GDP, business investment, and productivity. Um, here they're talking about the link between per capita, real GDP, business investment, and productivity. Um, per capita, real GDP is a standard measure of economic prosperity for a country is theoretically equal to output per person and income per person. Aggregate GDP can increase as the population gets larger, but unless GDP per capita also rises, the population is no better off than it was before. Per capita GDP growth is a function of level of business investment and total factor productivity. A rise in either raises per capita GDP growth. So basically they're saying um, 
you have to level out the amount of people to the GDP because if your population gets growing, then obviously you have more people contributing to the work pool and therefore more people overall generating more money. But, you know, if you don't average that out for population size, then you can kind of paint a little bit of a fuzzy picture, right? You're not, you're not getting the full context. Increasing business investment is relatively straightforward. Buying more equipment or software raises the productive capacity of an economy. However, it comes with diminishing returns. For example, investing in a second laptop for 10 workers will have a larger effect on output than buying 100 laptops for 10 workers. So, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, at my job, every tech has their own toolbox. Well, if you just give all the techs three toolboxes, then, you know, what the hell's the point? You only have, you know, let's say 10 techs, but if you have 30 toolboxes, but 10 techs, are you really better off? You got a lot more productive equipment, but you don't have more productive people. So, you know, once again, you're just not any better off. So that's kind of what they mean when they say diminishing returns. You can have all the capital equipment in the world, but you need the workers and the people who are willing to do the labor to increase the total output. Um, TFP growth is the additional output you can get with the same inputs. You can think of it as the recipe for business while fiscal capital and labor are the ingredients. TFP growth can come from a few sources. In some cases, TFP grows because of organizational changes. One example is the assembly line where rearranging the same workers and equipment yields more output per hour. The quality of input can also boost TFP. A more, <clears throat> a more highly skilled worker will produce more per hour work which means human capital improvement, skill building, raise productivity growth. Similarly, higher quality business investments will yield more output. A faster computer can process more data per hour than a slower model. For the latter two examples, one can think of TFP more as technological innovation rather than the recipe. So um, just kind of like a quick side tangent here before we continue on. Um, a lot of our environment, or not environmental, Jesus. Um, a lot of our economic growth is kind of stunned by the fact that we've had historically low interest rates for the last 20 years. I've went on a tangent about this on plenty of podcasts, but I'm going to elaborate it one more time here. Um, people are discouraged from saving. Therefore, um, there's no real reason for them to save, to invest in better capital equipment that would make them more productive. So that's why you see our GDP over the last like 20 years has been kind of stagnant. Um, people don't save anymore because interest rates are so low. So you don't see your savings grow and they're printing money like it's, you know, like drunken sailors. So um, the purchasing power of your dollars are eroding away so fast and you're not encouraged to hold on to them to see your savings grow. Therefore, it's very difficult to save money to invest in said capital equipment. It's a little side tangent. Um, raising business investment through trust. More trusting environments can reduce costs, freeing up funds for more investment. Trust can raise per capita real GDP growth by increasing the quantity of business investment that is possible. One way more investment is made possible is through cost reductions for everyday transactions. Simply put, lacking trust can be expensive. Writing and enforcing contracts, monitoring worker and subcontractor behavior, and implementing security protocols cost money. Um, kind of a little side tangent once again is that if you have to hire a police force to watch over your shop because there's no trust in your community, um, then you know you're losing money that's an investment that you have to make because of lack of trust in your overall community that's obviously a net positive or a net negative on your gdp and your overall production um building greater trust with stakeholders such as employees and supply chain partners enables an organization to reallocate investments in oversight and monitoring towards other parts of the business consider the increase in remote working as a result of the pandemic the trust between employers and their employees to work remotely has grown and as a result many organizations are planning to allow their employees to work remotely going forward that trust allows the business to rent less office space and save on real estate costs while improving employee satisfaction and productivity. To be sure, some costs will be unavoidable, but more trusting environments have a positive side effect on making some costs unnecessary and driving investment higher. Um, just to kind of speak to that, if you don't have to invest and spend all this money on renting buildings, why would you? Why would you continue to spend money if you don't have to? It just doesn't make sense. So we did see this throughout the pandemic. A lot of people work from home now. So you know, some businesses are just going to say, well, screw it. I'm not going to rent out the same business space anymore. I'm just going to shut my doors and people can work from home, whatever. That's fine. And some people are cool with that. 
Stronger trust in the financial sector makes capital more readily available. Banks lacking trust face quicker savings withdrawals during times of distress. Evidence suggests that the first people to withdraw their deposits following the collapse of the Lehman Brothers were those who had the least trust in their bank. If the banking sector had earned more trust from its customers prior to the Great Recession, it would have experienced fewer runs and therefore would have had more capital available to support the rest of the economy. Trust in the financial sector is also important outside of crises. More trusting households have historically kept a smaller share of their savings under the mattress and use credit granting institutions more frequently. This creates better outcomes for financial service providers and boosts the level of capital that can be used for um, business investment. Um, once again, <laughs> another little side tangent, but the reason why um, nobody cares where they put their money anymore is because the FTC, right? Um, the, the, all the uh, bank deposits are guaranteed by the government. So who the hell cares where your money goes? Because no matter what, if there's a run on the bank, if something happens, they're guaranteed. So you don't need trust in your bank anymore because you trust the government. Well, <laughs> once again, we shouldn't have to trust the government. We should be able to trust the banks and say, screw the government. The government should have any, shouldn't have anything to do with our financial system. And it has. And now we see runaway inflation. We have endless wars. We have, you know, single motherhood and single fatherhood running rampant more single motherhood than um, single fatherhood, obviously. But, um, you know, our economic incentives are all out of whack because the government got its hand in the money supply. We wouldn't have all these problems if we didn't have a Federal Reserve. Um, just kind of like a little picture, and it explains like the uh, trust and per capita real GDP. Um, for everybody listening, you guys can just click on the show notes and this graph will pop up and uh, just kind of give a little bit of explanation, a visual explanation of what I'm talking about. I'm boosting productivity through trust. Trust affects the quality and type of investments businesses make. A lack of trust can make some investments appear too risky, which can lead to suboptimal investment allocations. For example, countries with low levels of trust tend to invest in projects with shorter time horizons. Investments with longer time horizons require more trust in workers to complete the project and suppliers to get the necessary equipment and in customers to continue to be there through the useful life of the investment. Of the three major types of business investment structures, such as office buildings and warehouses, have the longest time horizon, followed by equipment, then intellectual property products, such as software. In the absence of trust, businesses may make only incremental gains to capacity through investments with short time horizons such as software, rather than expanding capacity more substantially through investments with longer time horizons such as structures. Um, once again, low interest rates, you're not encouraged to save, therefore there's not the same amount of money available for you to borrow, because in theory, there's only so much wealth that could be in circulation, but right now we have a Federal Reserve that just prints dollars, and you know you can do whatever you want, it doesn't matter, 0% interest rate, same as cash, whatever. Um, investment research and development suffers from a similar problem because the quality of research is nearly impossible to monitor while it's being conducted. Low trust between employer and researcher leads to lower rates of such investment. Lack of trust can therefore skew investment towards projects that are more easily monitored and less ambitious, forcing companies to give up on investments that have low potential to push past the current frontier of innovation. In other words, a higher trust environment between employer and researcher leads to the kinds of R&D investments that could yield higher value added innovations and that ultimately drive productivity. If the higher trusting environments have more ambitious R&D initiatives, they should have increased demand for well-educated and productive workers as a result. Greater demand for such workers can improve the average level of human capital in each firm throughout the broader economy. Um, trust enhances human capital investment, which raises productivity growth. Um, once again, I don't want to read through this entire article. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys get sick of hearing me talk as it is. Trust affects how businesses organize themselves. Um, trust can also boost productivity through means unrelated to additional investments. One way this occurs through decentralized decision-making. Um, if you're a libertarian, you're all about decentralization because you believe that people who will operate in their own best interests when left to free market situations. Um, I believe this to be true as well. Um, if you leave people to their own devices, they're going to act in their best interests, which generally, you know, greed is the greatest driver of prosperity, right? The only reason why... I can record this podcast is because somebody wanted to sell me a microphone. Someone wanted to sell me a computer. Somebody wanted to sell me a camera. Someone wanted me to sell this computer desk. Somebody wanted to sell something to make my life better off. And I was willing to part with the money that I had to get said items. So that way I could do what I wanted to do, which is record this podcast and, you know, drive to work and go on vacations to Florida. Um, all this is possible because of greed. A lot of people say that greed, you know, is this, you know, sinister thing, but it's really not. It's honestly the greatest driver of human prosperity that there is. 
So um, once again, I'll put this in the show notes below in case people want to read through this. Um, just a lot of good information here that I find fascinating um, just because this economic stuff really kind of gets my gears turning. Um, so this is just a paper about social trust and economic growth um, by Christian Bjornskov. Um, hopefully I got that right. Um, you can download this paper, but I'm going to read a little bit from the um, PDF here. Um, taking the overall association as a starting point, three different kinds of studies clearly define the early development of the literature on trust, growth, and access. Nack and Kiefer first found the strong association between trust and the long-run growth rate provide a long list of theoretical ideas and further tests. Zach and Nack found that the association was robust, applying to a larger sample, argued that part of the association was driven by an investment channel and provided the first casualty test. Finally, Whitley demonstrated that the association between trust and growth was robust to measure, measuring trust in a somewhat different way. Subsequent studies in, have in general established the statistical robustness of the association. Um, I'll just read the abstract. That was a little piece from the study. I don't want to bore you guys with the details, but this chapter provides a selective survey of the literature and the association between social trust and economic growth. The chapter is divided into two main sections. The first section outlines the main theoretical arguments for how social trust could affect the long-run growth rate and economic performance of the economy. These theoretical mechanisms can both be direct and work indirectly through affecting institutions, um, factor accumulation, and the elasticity of the substitution. An overview of a set of relevant theoretical mechanisms also reveals that some only affect growth under specific conditions. The second section is devoted to reviewing the evidence of an empirical association. While the literature clearly supports casual effect of trust on growth, the empirical section as well as, well as the conclusion suggests a number of ways in which the field may move forward. Um, once again, if you guys want to read this, go ahead. Um, over time, we can kind of see that is we lose more and more trust and the state gets bigger and bigger that um, poverty generally increases. And once again, we see more single mothers and more people turning to the state for government assistance because they can't rely on their family. So kind of reading from debt.org here, I will once again have this in the show notes. Um, we'll talk a little bit about poverty and where this kind of comes together. Um, how is poverty defined in America? According to the U.S. Census Bureau's 2019 current population report, 34 million Americans are considered impoverished, 10.5% of the country's population. The census supplemental poverty rate, which adjusts for how government programs keep people out of, out of poverty, was at 11.7% in 2019. The poverty rate for American children was 14.4, the lowest since 1973, and the rate for people 65 and older was 8.9%. Among the most impoverished are those living in female-headed households with no husband present, 24.3%, young adults without a high school diploma, 23.7%, and those living in a family whose head is unemployed, 26.4%, and minorities, 18.8% 18 .8 for Blacks. These numbers actually represent relatively good news. There were 4.2 million fewer people in poverty in 2019 than the year before, and the poverty rate is at the lowest since the statistic was first kept in 1959. The 2019 mark was the fifth consecutive annual decline in poverty. Poverty rates declined for all race and Hispanic origin groups. However, the Census Bureau numbers were compiled before the COVID pandemic sent the economy into a tailspin. Columbia University Center on Poverty and Social Policy estimated how the supplemental poverty rate changed on a monthly basis. Assessing the pre-COVID rate at 15% compared to the Census Bureau's 10.5%, the center said the poverty rate peaked at 17.3% in August of 2020, falling to 16% two months later, but concluded it would have been much worse with the ex extraordinary government intervention. Um, the one part where I will push back in this article is that we are borrowing from ourselves and our grandchildren tomorrow to benefit ourselves today. Um, right now, we're feeling inflation at what they say is 7%, but um, if you measure it back how they used to measure it before they gerrymandered the numbers, um, inflation would be almost double. So right now, we're seeing a dramatic drop in our standard of living because the dollars that we use no longer go as far as they once did. Um, they're asserting here that the poverty rate would be um, a lot higher without said government assistance, but I think you get a little temporary goose, you kind of paper over the scars, but you didn't really fix the root cause problem. Um, 
Continuing on, measuring the extent of poverty does nothing to ameliorate the lives of the poor, but compiling and understanding poverty statistics is essential to solving or at least addressing the problem. Governments, policymakers, and society at large depend upon precise and timely information about poverty to create and deliver the most effective solutions. The goal is to chip away bit by bit, family by family, and community by community at the scourge of poverty. Um, where is poverty most common in the U.S.? The face of poverty for most Americans is pictures of families, rundown housing in large cities where the industry has moved away. The true face of poverty, however, is found in rural areas of the South and Southwest regions of the U.S. where living conditions are even more rundown and industry never really started up. Nine of the 10 states with the highest poverty rates, two-year average 2018 to 19 in the U.S. are in the South. That includes Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, West Virginia, Kentucky, Alabama, South Carolina, Georgia, and North Carolina lead the way. The others, New Mexico, um, Mississippi is 19.4, Louisiana is 18.4, Arkansas 15, West Virginia 14.9, Kentucky 14.6, Alabama 14.4, South Carolina 13.9, Georgia 13.5, North Carolina 12.9, and New Mexico is 16%. Um, these areas have a long history of poverty, and there are many factors contributing to it, but most obvious are that there were agricultural economies, first and foremost, with light emphasis on education and innovation. Um, absolute poverty is a measure of, of the minimal requirements necessary to afford the minimal standards of life-sustaining essentials, food, clothing, shelter, clean water, sanitation, education, and access to health care. These standards are consistent over time and are the same in different countries. For example, one absolute measurement is the percentage of a population that consumes enough food daily to sustain the human body. Um, the standard is 2,000 to 2,500 calories per day is applied worldwide across all cultures. The World Bank defines poverty in absolute terms. Those living on less than $1.90 per day live in extreme poverty. Those living on less than $3.20 per day are in the lower middle income countries. Less than $5.50 in the upper middle income countries live in moderate poverty. For instance, in 2017, 6.5 million people in Europe and Central Asia, Asia Jesus, lived in extreme poverty compared with almost 431 million in Sub-Saharan Africa. The World Bank expects COVID pandemic to push between 88 million and 115 million people worldwide into extreme poverty in 2020 and, and, and up to 150 million in 2021. Reversing improvements that have been had been taking place. Global poverty had dropped to 1% per year per, er, between 1990 and 2015, the World Bank reports. Um, it's funny that they say the COVID pandemic pushed them. Um, it's not the pandemic. When you hear this, it's almost like gaslighting. The government had locked you in your home and told you that you weren't allowed to work. And people in these economies, sub-Saharan um, African economies, live sometimes hand to mouth, which literally means that the work that they do that day is what they use to purchase food that day to feed themselves. So if they're not allowed to work due to arbitrary COVID restrictions, then they will not be able to eat that day. Um, so it's so disingenuous and it's such like a gaslighting kind of thing to tell people that um, the COVID pandemic caused this. Well, no, it was government's reaction. Governments didn't have to do any of this. Governments didn't have to lock you down. They didn't have to put you in your home. It's a little bit of a touchy subject for me just because I, I find it so irritating the gall for people to say that it's the pandemic when you had tin pot dictators telling people they're not allowed to leave their homes. Um, relative poverty um, relative poverty is a measurement of income inequality within a social context. It does not measure hardship or material, material deprivation, but rather disparities of wealth among income groups. For example, the United States, a household that has a refrigerator, televisions, air conditioning, can be considered impoverished if its income falls below a certain threshold. In other countries, those households might be um, thought of as wealthy. Um, you kind of hear a lot about it, but you hear about people on welfare who drive an Escalade and get all the food they want and have air conditioning and six HDTVs, whatever. Um, poverty in the U.S. is obvious, obviously a lot different than other countries because our standard of living is very, very good. But um, once again, a lot of that standard of living comes as our um, as us being having the benefactor of having the world reserve currency. Um, 
probably finish up here, but uh, measuring U.S. poverty. The federal government's measure of U.S. poverty was developed in the 1960s by Molly Orshansky, an economist and statistician at the Social Security Administration. Orshansky based her original poverty thresholds on the Department of Agriculture's Economy Food Plan, which detailed what it considered the least expensive yet still nutritionally adequate diet for American families that were experiencing a temporary shortage of funds. She then deduced from the Department of Agriculture surveys that average families of three or more should spend about one third of their money on food. By multiplying that amount by a factor of three to include all other family expenses and applying various weighted data, Orshansky established a detailed matrix of 124 poverty thresholds for families of different sizes and compositions. Today, there are 48 thresholds. Poor families were those whose yearly income was below the threshold for that category. Over the years, many attempts have been made to improve or update or even replace Orshansky's methodology. In 1992, National Academy of Science panel suggested revisions to the system based on alternative definitions of both income and needs, suggesting that the traditional approach no longer provide an accurate picture of poverty. Legislation based on those findings has been introduced in Congress from time to time, but has never been enacted. Um, the Census Bureau used several alternative methods to calculate poverty and disease. Um, including the American Community Survey. In 2010, the Census Bureau introduced supplemental poverty measure to reflect long-term changes in government policies that alter the disposable income available to families and therefore their poverty status. However, the official rate is still based on data from the Bureau's current population survey, annual social and economic supplement. So basically whatever excess income you have that you're not spending on food is kind of what they're using to determine that. Um, reading from another paper here, um, I will have this in the show notes below. Once again, as always, overall Social Security had the largest estimated impact on the poverty rate for the total U.S. population. Um, the supplemental poverty rate would have been 8.2 percent points or 8.2 percentage points higher, or 23.5 percent, if individuals and families did not receive any Social Security benefits in 2014. Once again, this gets back to the point that I was kind of getting at earlier. We're kind of stealing from our future generations to pay off our current ones because our government spends way too much money. They don't have that social security money that they had stolen from you before. So therefore they just print the money and hand it to people. Um, refundable tax credits had the next largest impact. Poverty would have been 2.1 percentage points higher in the absence of the EITC alone. Um, excluding EITC and the additional child tax credit would have increased the poverty rate by 3.1 percentage points in 2014. About 9.8 million people would have been poor in 2014 without refundable tax credits. Um, I know I've hit on this in a different podcast. You can check out the, uh, I think it was COVID, welfare, and obesity. Uh, I cannot remember what episode that was, but nutrition assistance to individuals and families had the largest anti-poverty effect after tax credits. SNAP reduced the national poverty rate by 1.5 percentage points compared with poverty measured in the absence of SNAP benefits. Um, housing assistance and SSI each had the effort or had the effect of reducing poverty by about one percentage point. Um, in the absence of housing assistance or SSI alone, 2.8 to 3.8 million additional adults and children would have fallen into poverty in 2014. So you can see this a little dated, but I still think it's relevant. Um, so right here, I'm not gonna beat this study to death either, but um, impacts of a select safety net programs on supplemental poverty rate for children aged zero to 17. Um, you see kind of graphs where um, they're saying that basically tax credits had the greatest effect on overall um, reduction of poverty. Um, so basically like if the um, child tax or if the tax credits didn't exist, then um, poverty would be about 17.1% higher or 7.1% higher as um, the baseline is 16.7% is the child baseline. <clears throat> Um, many social safety net programs for low-income families have a larger anti-poverty impact for children than for the low-income population as a whole. These programs include WIC, the school lunch program, housing assistance, and child support. Nutrition assistance and refundable tax credits had the greatest anti-poverty effects. Um, once again, we'll kind of move on from here and maybe close out. But uh, it's, it's kind of funny. When you tax people... Um, I can't remember who said it, but what you tax, you get less of, and what you incentivize, you get more of. So when you tax people, eventually people respond to those incentives, and they're going to stop doing what is being taxed, right? The sin tax. Um, unfortunately, they tax income, which is ridiculous, at least here in Pennsylvania, um, 
but we still have to work to pay our bills. But, you know, you would think that's almost an incentive to not work. So that's why you see kind of people work in the gig economy and not claiming all their income, right? It's kind of a funny little side note there. Um, and this is a graph from the Independent Institute where it kind of elaborates some of the points that I was saying. Um, the failure of the war on poverty in one picture. It's a pretty short article. We'll kind of read this and wrap. Um, in 1950, the um, share of the population in poverty was about 30%, right? And you can see in 1950, it goes down from 53, jumps up a little bit in 56, and it continues to go down sharply, very, very sharply, until it gets to 1968, where the war on poverty begins. And then I don't want to say it flatlines, but it's kind of stable. Um, it sits right between, you know, I would say right around like 13% and at very highest, um, about 15%. Um, the poverty rate in the United States fell by half to the start of the war on poverty, and it was on track to continue falling. But after the war, poverty programs kicked in. Um, the poverty rate has been stuck in a narrow corridor. Um, the source was Jonathan Honig, um, Chicago, Illinois, based on the U.S. Census data. The lesson, despite good intentions, status redistribution programs to quote unquote help the poor lead to multi generational dependency on shrinking and shrinking opportunities and incentive for low skill individuals to enter the workforce. Increase their skills and move up <clears throat> the income ladder. On the other hand, a steady private investment in physical human capital with a, within a secure system of private property rights, which minimizes government corruption and exploitation, results in self sustaining prosperity, which enables poor people to take advantage of opportunities and permanently lift themselves out, out of poverty. Um, prior to the war on poverty, the post-1950 U.S. economy wasn't a capitalist nirvana, but it did benefit the poor much more than the Great Society programs. The numbers speak for themselves. All right, so we will stop the share here, and I'll give some closing thoughts. Um, that last article really sums up my thoughts. Um, when you have this generous state, then people are going to stop doing what they were once doing prior to having this overly generous state. Um, when you have a government that is willing to hand out free money to everybody, once again, people will do what's incentivized. When you incentivize people to not work, they will not work. We saw this with the COVID pandemic. Um, right now, the unemployment rates like, what is it, six to 8% somewhere around there, but our overall workforce participation rate is like 62%. So you have 40% of people almost not working or working in the gig economy versus being you know, loyally employed. Um, the reason why this all ties in is because people don't have the same trust that they once did. You don't trust employers as much. You don't trust your families as much. You don't trust your partners as much. There's a lot of lost trust in society. So therefore you need something to kind of monitor and be the arbiter of trust in this whole deal, which is the state. The state needs to come in and make sure that people don't fall into despair. And therefore you can continue to print dollars and grow the state to make up for the lack of trust in communities. Because if you have these tight-knit communities, then you no longer need a state because, hey, you can go to your neighbor, they'll help you out. Um, you go to your local church, your church will help you out. That's the way things were back in the day. And I'm not saying that we should go back to, you know, repeal the 19th and go back in time and, you know, just like the good old days. But we have so much more technology and so much more knowledge at our fingertips and so much more capability, um, which is the advancements in technology now that we shouldn't really have to worry about having this big government because, you know, just the rapid advancement in our daily lives. Um, so this is why I kind of believe social conservatism is so important to libertarianism, because I think this is the best way to cultivate a society that respects property rights and overall will tolerate freedom the best. I've said it before, and it seems like a lot of people agree. I'm sure there's people that think I'm silly for thinking this way, but um, that's just the way I see it. I've never smoked weed, cigarettes, or anything like that in my life. I did live a little bit more degeneratively. I'm not going to air all that um, stuff here, but um, before I was um, dating my current fiance, who we've been dating for a little over three years now, um, I believe that people should find a partner that they love and have vetted very, very well and would like to cultivate a family with so they can pass on these libertarian values and the values of freedom and rugged individualism like this country was founded on to propagate a society that you know has respect for property rights and 
um, freedom overall so we can live in and Kapistan. <laughs> that's kind of my goal. I think that's all of our goals as libertarians, right? So um, if you guys kind of like these monologues, feel free to just let me know, tell me what you think. Um, it seems like a lot of the health stuff, the health monologues and kind of diving into some of the science and my thoughts on the stuff, um, these podcasts generally do pretty well. So um, I appreciate I appreciate everybody listening. Um, don't forget this podcast is now sponsored by Axe and Sledge Supplements. Use code MATOVIC10, M-A-T-O-V-C-I-K, one zero at checkout when you do your shopping there to get a, a little discount. Let them know I sent them your way. And, um, you know, my goal is to make the most Jack and Tan libertarians out there. <laughs> so um, Axe and Sledge will definitely help you get there. Um, I would love for people to um, to develop themselves in every way that they see fit. Um, my vision for the Libertarian Party and just libertarians as a whole is a army of tight-knit families, um, you know, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, all together um, living healthy, robust lives to bring us to freedom because we will no longer need a state. We will have strong communities and strong families that don't need anybody outside of themselves to maintain the lives that they want to live. That's my vision. Um, I'm sure some people would have issues with that, but that's just the way I see it. So um, like I said, if you guys like this stuff, just let me know. Um, I I'm very fascinated by this topic and I think it's something that more libertarians should talk about. And uh, yeah. Subscribe, like, share, do whatever you're going to do. But um, until next time, everybody, take care and thanks for listening.